Welcome to the History of Parliament's YouTube channel. My name is Sammy Sturgis, the Public Engagement Manager at the History of Parliament, and in this video I'll be speaking to Dr Robin Eagles about Robert Walpole, the so-called First Prime Minister of Britain. This is the second video from our series about parliamentary leadership. Robin is the editor of our House of Lords 1660 to 1832 project and the co-editor of the recently published volume Henry Bennett, Earl of Arlington and His World. Robert Walpole had been an important figure in Parliament for two decades, before emerging as the effective Premier Minister. In 1742, after two decades at the top, during which time he dominated the state of politics, and 40 years in the Commons, he was made the Earl of Orford and spent his final years in the House of Lords. In this video, we'll unpack how he emerged as the Premier, or Prime Minister, over other prominent Whig politicians of his day. Hi Robin, how are you doing today? Hi Sammy, I'm all right. It's a bit good, cold, but it's all right. How are you? Good. Yeah, not too bad, thank you. The sun's just starting to come out here, thankfully. Right. Um, I've locked the dog up, so we shouldn't be interrupted. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> um, so today we're here to talk about Robert Walpole and his um, premiership. Uh, so first of all, I thought it would be good if we could just get a little bit of a sense of what sort of background Robert Walpole had from a family point of view, but also from a political point of view. Okay, so politically Walpole is a Whig. He's very much associated with a court group that is very much interested in power. So when he, when he comes into Parliament, he within four years he's established himself as quite an important member of the House of Commons, and in 1705 he has his first job in government. His background, his family background, is, is important because both his father and his grandfather had been MPs before him. There had even been a Walpole as far back as Edward VI reign. But they're an important Norfolk uh, family. They hold uh, an interest in a constituency called Castle Rising, which is where Walpole has his first seat. And they also uh, share the interest um, in Kings Lynn, which is the second seat he holds and the one that he will continue to hold for the rest of his time in the House of Commons. Uh, for the time that Walpole's in Parliament, he's joined by two of his brothers, Galfridus and Horatio. Uh, and at some point, he has two sons there, uh, Edward and Horatio. They like the name Horatio in the family. Uh, and an older son, uh, his, his heir, also called Robert, actually goes straight to the House of Lords. Mm -hmm. Walpole is offered a peerage himself and he turns it down and prefers that his son should go to the Lords instead. So we've got quite a big parliamentary dynasty there, lots of people there who are quite important, and also very significantly, Walpole's brother-in-law is the second Viscount Townsend, another important Norfolk grandee. So they really dominate that area of the country and several seats in the House of Commons and in the House of Lords. Yeah. And um, thinking a little bit more about his influence in Parliament and how he became to be the Prime Minister, could you just say a little bit more about sort of the process of his rise to that position of prominence? I suppose the first thing is he's a very good speaker. Uh, people speak of his golden tongue, although people who don't like him very much think he's impertinent. He, uh, He's, he's, very, he's very capable in the House of Commons, so he, his, he gets an awful lot of early experience in committee work and acting as a teller, speaking in the Commons. So that gives him his sort of early position, but he's extremely astute at working out who the important people are to, uh, to cultivate at court. And so he has, as I say, his, said his first job in 1705, he's then promoted in 1708 to an important role, Secretary at War. So by the time he's, he become Prime Minister in large inverted commas in 1721, he's been in government on and off for a long time. He's got a lot of experience. He also develops, and this is very crucial as well in his rise, um, a reputation for being financially enormously astute. The City of London trusts him. He's made Chancellor of the Exchequer in 1715 for the first time, holds up for two years, gets that again in 1721. And he's seen as somebody who has a, a great command of figures. 
people speak of him being just enormously talented at looking at accounts and looking at uh, balance sheets and being able to get to the nitty gritty of them right at the beginning. So we have this combination of skills with him. He, he's very capable in the house as a speaker, but he's also got this work ethic. You know, he thinks nothing of being at his desk at six in the morning. He works very hard and he knows who to talk to. So those combinations really put him into a prime position. Mm -hmm. So um, it would be great if we could talk a little bit more about, sort of, you said prime minister in inverted commas, obviously in popular history, Robert Walpole is thought of as the first prime minister. Um, but you, you've mentioned um, Townsend there is another major figure in the Whigs at this point, um, and I think there are a couple of others um, that we could probably dig into, um, Stanhope and Sunderland spring mm -hmm. to mind. Um, so could we talk a little bit more about how he sort of rose to be the Prime Minister above those other key players? Yeah. Um... The, um, the Hanoverian accession is, is, is key to all this. So Walpole had been in government, as I said, back in 1705 through to 1711, when he finally loses power in the reign of Queen Anne. He then comes back in with this new Whig grouping at the accession of George I. And the first group to really um, dominate power um, in those early years are two pairings. So you've mentioned Stanhope and Sunderland, James Stanhope, then Charles III out of Sunderland. Uh, they're one group and they have a great deal of um, influence in the house and a great deal of influence over George I himself. Mm -hmm. and the other is really dominated by this Walpole Townsend axis. And for the first couple of years they work together. But in 1717 there's a big falling out, there's what's known as the Whig split, and that endures for a couple of years, 1717 through to 1719 into 1720. Um, the Whigs fall apart, um, and this is largely a power grab by Stanhope and Sunderland. Mm -hmm. They have managed to uh, man uh, manipulate the king to an extent, or at least dominate the king's councils, uh, and they back his, his foreign policy interests in a way that Walpole and Townsend don't. So Walpole and Townsend are pushed out into the cold. They find themselves having to operate with the opposition, uh, looking to the Prince of Wales who falls out with his father. And so we have an actual division of the courts as well. And so in a sense, they bide their time. They, they're very effective as an opposition. They, they stand in the way of uh, several key policies Stanhope and Sunderland are trying to put through. And so by 1720, the government has to give in effectively. Mm -hmm. They find they can't get their business through Parliament because of how effective Walpole and Townsend's uh, opposition is. And so they're invited back in. And you have briefly this resumption of those four people dominating the top. Walpole comes through because in part, the others fall away. Stanhope dies in 1721, um, he's accused uh, in uh, the House of Lords of corruption and he's giving a very sort of energetic speech about it and he bursts a blood vessel and falls down dead. Yeah. Uh, Sunderland dies um, shortly after the general election of 1722, having overexerted himself doing that. And so in a sense, just by natural attrition, Walpole mm -hmm. emerges from this group in the early 1720s as the most important of the ministers. Okay. So, He's, he starts out in life really as a, as a fairly traditional early modern premier minister, one of several, sharing power not necessarily very easily. And it's only later that he, he comes through as what we would think of as a prime minister. Okay. And then when um, Townsend sort of fell away, maybe you could say something a little bit more about sort of, you know, how he usurped him. Um, but also maybe sort of when exactly, is there like a particular point when he's sort of recognized as the prime minister? Um, the great moment for Walpole is 1727, I think really, uh, the death of George I. This is a crisis point for Walpole. He'd established a good rapport with the king in the 1720s, um, not least because of the way he'd managed the South Sea bubble crisis, which might be something we'll, we'll revisit. Um, but in 1727, when George II becomes king, 
he wants to do away with Walpole. He chooses to Spencer Compton, who's the Speaker of the House of Commons, to be the new Prime Minister. And he tells Walpole to go away and take his orders from Compton. Now, Walpole's very lucky because Compton proves to be entirely incompetent mm -hmm. and hands a lot of responsibility back to Walpole and asks him to help him draw up a civil list, draw up a king's speech. And Walpole does this with such uh, enormous talent that the king recognises that he'd got the wrong man and he goes back to back to Walpole, he's given this fantastic uh, package with a very generous civil, civil list. And also, very importantly, Walpole gives an extremely generous settlement to the new queen, Caroline of, of Ansbach, who uh, has long been a, uh, a fan of Walpole's anyway. He's been cultivating her, having very early on recognised that she's really quite important. So 1727 really is this moment for Walpole. He very nearly loses it all at that point. And he's, he's given it back, in a sense, but he makes the most of it. Townsend is still hanging there, in there in the background, but he just increasingly becomes disgruntled. Um, there are comments about the fact that he uh, resents the fact that at Walpole's levee, everyone's there and only a few flatterers come to Townsend's anymore. So by 1730, he, he actually just retires from politics, effectively. He retires back to his estates in Norfolk and cultivates turnips. Okay, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Um, so could you maybe just um, briefly, very briefly, say what the South Sea Bubble was for us? Yeah, so the South Sea Company was a joint stock company which was established by the Tories during Queen Anne's reign as a rival to the Bank of England, which is a Whiggish uh, institution. And it, its major uh, trading interest is in the slave trade. Uh, it mm -hmm. gets the monopoly on uh, sending slaves from Africa to uh, the Spanish colonies in South America. So it's involved in pretty in unpleasant trade, but it's also extremely involved as an investment company in taking over parts of the national debt. And through the 17 teens, it becomes increasingly influential and, and people uh, invest in ever higher numbers. Uh, and in, through a variety of different slightly nefarious schemes, including some rather fraudulent ones, uh, mis-selling shares, insider dealing, all those kind of rather wonderful things. Um, the, uh, the, the, the company gets into a position where its share price rockets up. So by early 1720, it's trading at about a thousand pounds a share. It's going completely out of yeah. control. And inevitably the bubble bursts. The foreign investors initially start pulling out, then the, in, uh, uh, the, the, the internal ones and people are ruined overnight. The whole thing collapses in a heap. Um, and the traditional view is that Walpole walks into this crisis and he solves it. And he becomes yeah. a great sort of financial genius who solves this, this terrible economic disaster. Um, it's a bit more complicated than that as, as usual. Historians disagree a little bit on how key he was. The other, he's in government. Um, at the time the bubble bursts. He's been in government for a few months at the time that the crisis hits. Um, and indeed, he'd invested heavily in the South Sea Company himself. He lost quite a lot of money in the South Sea bubble, and he would have lost more if his own financial uh, advisor hadn't told him to stop buying shares. So he's not quite as brilliant when it comes to the South Sea Company as people have assumed. Um, and there's also a certain amount of disagreement as to whether or not the uh, the, the, the uh, program he puts in place is actually as effective as, as, as it's previously been thought. But in a sense, this is maybe missing the point. The point is that Walpole establishes a reputation of mm -hmm. however reasonably people think of him as the man who saves the day in the wake of the South Sea bubble. Mm -hmm. And he carries that reputation through with him. So you could say that you can argue the, 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 the economics of it um, and people you know, will disagree for a long time, I'm sure. But it's, it's that point. He, he achieves a reputation as, as the saviour of the, of the country's financial institutions. He sees the way through the bubble and puts the country back on an even economic keel. Mm -hmm. And would you say that reputation um, helped him to maintain his position at the top for such a long time? I think he was you know, recognised as prime minister for, what, almost two decades? Yes, I mean, if, if we think of him as Prime Minister from 1721 and uh, suggested it, that's perhaps a little bit more complicated than the sounds. Mm. Um, but yes, he's, he's, he's certainly dominant for a very long period. 
His financial reputation is certainly important in that. There are others, of course. Yeah. Well, corruption, straightforward corruption. He bribes yeah. people. Um, there's this rather marvellous um, quotation from The Craftsman, which is an opposition newspaper, which likens the House of Commons in his period to this uh, monstrous beast called Polyglot, which has 500 heads and tongues and all fed by gold and silver. And Walpole is the master of 300 of them and the tongues lick his feet and other bits of his person. And we'll leave that to one side. But mm -hmm. he, he buys up large chunks of the House of Commons. So he's, uh, at his height, he's probably got about 200 placemen that he can rely on. So those are M MPs who have some sort of government job in his gift. Um, yeah. And there are other people with pensions and, and, and other straightforward bribery. Um, I think one also has got to hand it to him. He is a master of detail, a master of information. So you only need to look through the archive, the, room, the, the surviving archive, which is a, a small tip of what was originally there uh, in his papers in, in now in Cambridge University Library. Um, he's got his finger in every single pie. He's got informers everywhere. He's a brilliant master of information. And uh, so this is also very important. He's just on top of so much detail about the lives of really quite minor people in the country that you can see how he manages to put together this great big sort of web of web of, uh, of, of, of control. So we have bribery, we have, you know, sheer hard work and information management and, and a great deal of club ability as well. I think, you know, he uses his seat in Norfolk, Houghton Hall to really good effect. People go there to be entertained, to be told what's going on, to be kept advised. He has a great art collection there. Uh, he knows how to pull the right strings. He knows how to influence people in a really quite fascinating way. Yeah. I think that's, um, yeah, that's about all the questions that I wanted to cover today. Um, so thanks so much for taking the time to speak to me and to tell us about Robert Walpole's uh, parliamentary leadership. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's been, uh, been a pleasure. <laughs>